Welcome to Design Notes. I'm Liam Spradlin, and this week I spoke with Jason Schwartz and Alex Shane of Avondale Type Co. We talked about what actually goes into designing fonts, the subdued personalities of good typefaces, and the business of forging a typeface, including the challenges designers face with sales, licensing, distribution, and of course, piracy. Let's get started. All right, welcome to Design Notes, you guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, So you guys are from Avondale Type Co., um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I guess some of the history of ATC and like how you guys got to basically where you are today. Okay, so the beginnings of Avondale Type Co. I think we're about uh, three, between two and three years old at this point. Is that accurate, Alex? Uh, that sounds about right. We, a- Alex and I, are both part of Bright Bright Great, which is a design studio in Chicago, and. We had a bunch of projects in a row that came through that were very type heavy. Um, obviously, most of our projects are type heavy, but this was actually creating custom letter forms, a lot of uh, enough to almost get close to a full typeface, uh, minus the the uh, alternates and and punctuation and stuff and. We, we were talking about it here, and we basically decided if we've come so close, why don't we actually just start making some fonts? Right. And uh, on my end, I mean, I, I've been sort of, I, I was sort of like half-assed designing fonts um, since like college, even, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'd even go as far as to say um, like high school a lot of my doodles in like my my notebooks would uh, would go more towards the like type design side or like drawing words and like weird interesting characters and, and stuff like that. So I've always been very interested in it. Um, definitely learned uh, a heck of a lot in like type design classes in in uh, in college, um, and then. Uh, basically just like dabbled in a few uh, like free type making programs Um, it didn't release anything but then um, like Jason said like we had this big type heavy project and I realized I sort of like had all the skills to do it at that point so I might as well just try putting something real together um, and sort of using the the resources that BBG could give me to uh, to release it um, basically to add to what Alex was talking about, when we first started Avondale Type Co., there was a couple things that we, that was at least important to us and, and that we wanted to, to kind of figure out. Um, the first was when we were making our first font, we were, we're looking into how do we do this? What do we make it with? What are the programs that are important, uh, to put this thing together? Uh, I think our first two typefaces were somewhat of a learning curve for us. They were the, the the least complete typefaces, and they were the longest learning curve in uh, Glyphs, which is the software that we use to, to produce them. Um, but when we first started it, one of the things that's really important to me in general uh, running a design agency is typography. This is obviously... the a massive key component of what we do every day. You know, I'm, I'm ty- as type snobby as the next person. Uh, it's something that has to always be on point. And it's something that designers really love, including Alex and myself. It's, it's definitely uh, something that's been part of our day and not even really part of our day. It's something that pretty much controls our day as we go through all of our projects and, and put all this stuff together. So as Alex was saying, as he started working on some of these incomplete typefaces and as we started translating them into fonts and things like that, uh, the biggest thing that was important to me was that Avondale Type Co. could live as something a little bit larger than just a type foundry. And we're only at the beginning and infancy of this stuff, so we're still kind of learning as we go. Uh, but with a lot of type foundries, I think House does a real well. I think House does a good job of of pushing the type through uh, swag and merchandise and the things that they do. Uh, I, I think a lot of the other ones that I can think of off the top of my head don't really do a good job of continuing to foster an environment of 
getting good type in people's hands, whether it be, you know, cool t-shirts that have, that have typefaces on them, poster prints, screen prints, uh, risograph prints, or just the, the typefaces themselves. But one of the original goals of Avondale Type Co. was not only to produce a font and then kind of move on to the next one. It's uh, important for us to do type-related things. And Alex and I were actually talking yesterday. Uh, again, being new, this stuff is kind of new, and I know I'm skipping around a little bit on this list, on the, uh, the bullet list, but Avondale uh, Type Co. Artist Series grew out of that, and we can get to that a little bit later. But it, it's, it's a space where people can continue to create and make cool things, and it's not limited to did you use this on the web or not, or is this in a print or not kind of thing. Right. So kind of going deeper than, uh, I guess, I often think like um, when you're designing something like a font, you want people to use it and like for it to appear places, but actually going further than that into like how else does it fit into their lives? Yeah, it's really cool to not only have the typefaces for use in you know commercial work and personal work and stuff like that. That's been one of the most interesting things, I think, to both Alex and myself is you put out a typeface and you think it's going to be used one way and then you start to see the execution and you, you didn't really see it going that way. Um, but that's kind of the spice of, of life of what we do. The, the other component, which is all of the other things related to type and what we love about it is really what continues to drive Avondale Type Co. on all the other days when we're not releasing typefaces or, or working on them. It's fostering a community, being a part of it, we're in Chicago, so it's it's uh, lectures and stuff in Chicago. Um, also, I, I I keep referencing Alex and and myself, but we didn't really introduce ourselves and what our roles are sure. at, <laughs> at Avondale Type Co. So I know we're like five minutes in or whatever, but I think it's actually a good a good time for Alex to talk about introduce himself and what he what he does. Yeah, go for it. Sure. Um, so I'm Alex. Uh, I'd say I'm the the main type designer here at Avondale Type Co. Um, uh, on top of designing most of the typefaces that we have live on our site right now, um, I've also uh, for for anything that's that's uh, not designed by me, I've played a some sort of part in helping that like typeface come through. So like for, for a lot of our contributors or um, people that have made fonts for us, um, I've uh, vetted the fonts and sort of like given my critique and notes and, and helped guide that process a little bit. Um, so that's what I do. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pretty much concerned with the, with the type. Awesome. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Jason Schwartz. Uh, I essentially act as the overarching creative director of Avondale Type Co. Uh, A Avondale Type Co. grew organically, so it's not like I started a company and Alex works there. Uh, like I said earlier, we both work at Bright Bright Great, the design firm in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in terms of keeping Avondale Type Co. moving forward, my focus is more so now on the brand itself and things like artist series. And Alex and I were talking about doing a uh, like an eight week typography course and things like that. Those are the things that that I'm taking a part in. I have helped uh, guide and vet Alex on some of the typefaces that he's created in terms of, hey, I'd like to focus on a mono. Here's some of my favorites and things that I really love about using them. Can we go there? Uh, that role is, I guess, more on like a creative director side of things. I actually don't produce any of the typefaces myself. Um, and then myself and one other person, Nick Lush, who works, who works with us also handle the, I guess, like enterprise sales and, and customer support and all of the things and, and communication around, you know, it's, it, it is an e-commerce experience, so so we do have to have some time focused around helping people make sure that they got everything and that it's working on their computers and, and stuff like that. Right, right. And I think to add to what Jason was saying, um, a big part of what he does uh, within within the realm of like the, uh, being the creative director is um, basically drive what the 
the typefaces look like in terms of like, like we'll come at them with ideas or I'll come at them with ideas. I'm always, I'm constantly like trying to figure out ideas for fonts and drawing stuff up and trying different letter forms. And he's the one that can sort of like curate that and vet which ones we can see uh, selling well, basically, because like it or not, this thing has become like a business for us. So we have to make smart business choices. And that's, I think, a big part of Jason's job here. Right. It's like the, uh, the business of art and the art of business. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's real deal, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of uh, getting into your guys' process overall at um, Avondale Type Co. So I want to dig in a little bit to that. Um, I know you touched on tooling, uh, but like what programs you guys use? Um, I guess what a typical day looks like. So the first thing and most important to me with the process of fonts is that we make sure that all of them have names relating to horror movies. Uh, (laughs) Whether or not people actually can put that back together, I think things like ATC Kruger is a little more on the nose than uh, ATC Overlook or ATC Timberline. But all of the, the, the typefaces that we've created have been named based on how we feel about them in the horror movie space. Uh, but maybe Alex, if you wanted to talk a little bit about our process in terms of you're sketching things out, we've had a few meetings and talked about them. Maybe you can tell a little bit about that. So I, I tend to just like dive right in. I know a lot of other designers will spend a lot of time like on paper, rendering by hand, uh, getting to like a high level of fidelity before bringing it into glyphs. But for me, I, I really like to just, like I said, to just like dive right in. Um, I, I usually don't start a typeface uh, cold. Like I'll have a lot of idea in my head as to what I want it to look like, um, or at least what, I, what uh, feel I want it to have, or maybe I have like a lot of inspiration for a certain character and want to see what I can build from there. Um, as far as like rendering by hand, I do think it's important to, uh, if you're gonna do any sort of typeface that is supposed to in some way mimic um, handwriting, and that's not limited to just like scripty fonts, that's also um, a lot of sans serifs, the the stroke weight will mimic like uh, a parallel pen or something. Um, So I will try to just play around with the pen that it's supposed to mimic, or um, maybe just a brush pen to see like what would naturally happen if you were to to write that out or something. But that's pretty much as far as it goes. Um, I, let's see, how deep do we want to get here? Uh, So my program of choice is Glyphs app. Um, I've used Fontographer, I've used FontLab, I've used RoboFont, um, and a few other things. Uh, if Glyphs app is my favorite by far, um, I can't really speak to why necessarily, but it's just really intuitive. Uh, one of my favorite things about it is how much documentation and really clear and easy to follow tutorials there are for that app. So that one's really easy to just like if I run into some like weird issue that I'm having, I can always figure it out just by going to their like tutorial community section. Um, what else? I mean, I feel like a lot of what's important to to creating like a good font is really studying what it's supposed to be, basically. Um, if I'm gonna do like a sans serif. I'm gonna spend a lot of time learning everything there is to know about why a sans serif looks the way it does. What are the rules? Uh, what have people done in the past? Why, like, who invented the first sans serif? I mean, I've already studied all of this stuff, but like, who invented the first sans serif? Why do serifs exist in the first place? Like, uh, what's the deal with stroke weights? What, why, you know, all that stuff. So it's really important for me to know a lot about what I'm trying to make before I try to make it. It's not necessarily entirely about um, the, 
just the like look of it, just like trying to make something that looks nice. I, I want it to fit into like the, the culture of type. And I think yeah, I that guess. puts uh, Alex, I think that puts us at a interesting point in the creation process. So as Alex has started to put some visuals together for everybody else surrounding Alex, that's the typical point where he's been looking at it from how am I creating this? You know, how is it structured? What are the, what are the letter forms and, and, and what is, where, do, where do we think this thing is going? There's a major piece after that, which is in use uh, that happens during that process. So what I typically do is interject myself after there's enough characters to, to put a paragraph of, of text together letter with enough characters, numbers, letters, letter forms, punctuation, alternates, maybe some, some additional pieces of the, of the typeface. Uh, and at that point, I typically ask, and, and even myself, start to try to put that into use. So if we think it's a display face and we're going to use it on something that's you know not... Uh, body copy or not in a paragraph setting. Give me, give me a couple words. Give me, give me a bunch of different words. Give me some numbers. Give me some symbols. And what we typically tend to do at that point is I take my, uh, I, I basically print it all out and take it over a weekend and sit with it and I circle characters as they start to stick out to me as needing refinement. So. Alex or Quan, who has released a couple of fonts with us, um, or, or really anybody else, we, we, I want to talk about the contributor versus in-house thing in a second, but uh, when, when people are creating this, I typically interject myself at about the 66% mark and basically say, give me everything you got so far, even if the characters aren't, aren't finished. Uh, I want to spend some time with it. I want to make sure that, that the, the weighting and the balance and all these things are doing what we want them to do. And it's kind of like a... Uh, an intervention where we can either figure out like all's good or we, we need to look in, into figuring out how we can make changes to this face so that it, it, it achieves what we want it to achieve. You know, if you're working on a mono, you have your option of how you want to balance that thing out. If you're working on a serif, what do those serifs look like? And, and what about characters that are a little bit harder to create? Did we do it in a way that's going to feel, feel really good or do, do we need to refine a little bit? Yeah, and as, as like a designer, um, I think the biggest epiphany I had about type design was realizing that when you're designing, when you're designing a font, when you're designing a typeface, you're not designing a character ever. You're not like the goal is not to design a character. The goal is to design a word. The goal is to design a sentence, basically. So. Um, when you're designing a character, you're designing basically a puzzle piece uh, of a larger puzzle, right? So it's it's uh, an epiphany that I had that has really helped me make better fonts because if I just design a bunch of good-looking letters, there's no way to know that they're going to look good together. There's no way to know that in the way that people are going to use them, which is always in the context of a word or a sentence or a paragraph, that they're going to look good. Right. And I think that kind of leads into something else I wanted to talk about, uh, which is, you know, um, I do UI UX, so I design mm -hmm. software and we have like very certain testing, uh, kind of processes for that, both with like user testing and user acceptance and also mm -hmm. just testing the code. Uh, so I guess what you guys are describing kind of fits into the testing of typefaces, but what else goes yep. into that? Sure. So I wanted to add a piece about this, which Alex was starting to allude to, which is you put the letter forms together and you have the word. I approach it differently. I think of it more so as we're trying to convey an emotion. That's what, uh, for me, typefaces do and why I would choose one over the other and, and what can I bring into this that adds something. Some of our typefaces are... Uh, a little bit more off the uh, off the dartboard than than kind of bullseye. We've done some things like uh, ATC Nasty, which is like a slimy. It, it, it's like a drippy font. It's like such fringe use. Um, harkens to the uh, garbage pail kids era of the eighties. Um, but it, it, in terms of the user testing, 
when you were t- asking basically what is a, a typical day, the typical day is not most of the time designing the typeface. <laughs> That's some of the time, but a majority of the time that we spend on a typical day is pretty much doing the user testing, which is let's create graphics using this. Does it feel good? Do all the sizes feel good? What happens when we go small? What happens when we go italics, italicized? What happens when we're, when we're bringing two of our faces together? You know, do the weights work? Stuff like that. Uh, I would say at Avondale Type Co., because we're, a lim- we're limited resources, we don't have 20 people here working on this stuff. We, on any given day, have two and a half. Um, the, the majority of time we spend is, is creating things to show people, to show them how you can use this typeface. Uh, whether or not that's essentially user testing, we, we do give out some betas of our, of our typefaces, but typically that creates a mess because people have it installed under beta names and then your system has it in there and you try to bring the next one and then it hasn't fully uninstalled and things like that. But So it, in my I, Jason sort of alluded to the fact that a typeface has, uh, has emotion. Um, I'll agree with that, but I think in my opinion, what it has more of is personality. Uh, when I design a typeface, I'm trying to go for a personality, and I think it's the use that gives it emotion or doesn't give it emotion. So uh, if I'm trying to design a typeface that is very, very usable uh, and like basically like a workhorse, I'm trying to give it a very subdued personality. And if I, when I see it in use, and I can see it being used in a way where uh, one use gives it one very distinct emotion and another use can give it a, one very, very other distinct emotion, then I know that I did my job well because I made a very subdued personality for that font that can be where emotion can easily be added to it in a ver- variety of different ways. Uh, if I'm designing uh, like a really intense like headline font or like a very unique, something very unique, uh, I am trying to do the opposite. I'm trying to give it a lot of personality uh, so that the designer, when they take that font, they know what they're going to get. It's going to feel the same in a lot of different use cases. I could buy that. Good answer, Alex. (laughs) Cut that out. (laughs) It's uh, just showing off different facets of the same personality, I guess. Right. Um. I do want to explore a little bit, Jason, uh, you were talking about beta testing fonts. That's something I wanted to ask about as well. Um, And the problems that you pointed out of people kind of having old copies installed and like not having a really graceful way to keep that updated, I guess, comes to like the technology of type design. Like uh, my impression from the outside kind of is uh, that... You know, I always want to make a comparison to what I work on, which is like apps and software, where Mm -hmm. we have like a very structured way of updating things and distributing things. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I get the impression that type design is a little bit behind that. But do you think that moving closer to something like that would be beneficial? And like, what do you think that would look like? Uh, For for me, if I take this on, like, I definitely feel a strong urge to, to move whatever we're doing in a direction where our fonts are like very usable on web, very usable for uh, a lot of the the cases that we're, we're going to be seeing typefaces used in. I think that a lot of type design these days is still being designed with print use in mind. I think a lot of the programs that uh, are made for designing typefaces are still print designed. I think that um, a lot of like the the tropes in in type design are based off of very archaic ways of doing things. Um, just the other day, I was talking with like one of our developers who came out with, with the issue that she was basically asking like, uh, every time she goes to set text, uh, it doesn't end up in the exact same spot as where it was designed for because the center of the font is never the same. Like the center of a typeface doesn't show up in the same way, and that's how you like would develop it based on like the center of a line. Uh, I I don't know anything about dev necessarily, so that might be wrong, but um, that's that's how I understood her question. And 
nobody's designing fonts specifically for that use, as far as I know. Like, uh, if you were to, to design a font that fixed that problem, it would have the exact amount of space above and below it, right? There's no fonts that do that. You pretty much just add enough space uh, to accommodate the descender and the ascender height. So there is a lot of room for growth and that's definitely something that intrigues me in trying to like see where we can go with that and see how optimized for the future we can, we can make our typefaces with the limited resources that we have. I think there's also to, to add in addition to what Alex was talking about. So type doesn't live neutrally in a, sit, in a void on your computer. So you get your computer and you've paid for some licenses that aren't previously installed when you bought that computer. Uh, and then you basically get typefaces or fonts as a designer and, 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 and where do they go? Uh, the tools ar around that are, are a little bit messed up still because you have companies like, uh, or, or you have things like Font Explorer Pro uh, and then you have companies like Adobe, and Adobe is building all these things, and Font Explorer Pro is always trying to keep up. And so you you have all these typefaces, and you're trying to run management, and you can't leave all of your typefaces installed always. I think I have something like 100,000 different fonts and weights and things like that on my computer. You, you turn on 1,000, and you start to crawl. Um, and, and, and that's... I'm not saying that that is like a legacy uh, print to computer to, to typeface kind of thing. There, the, the book that comes pre-installed on a Mac is like not nearly good enough for what you need as a designer. Um, but the, there are some tools. Like I, I really have stuck with Font Explorer Pro for probably at this point like eight years. Uh, and, and typically where I get caught up is... Uh, Adobe Creative Cloud up, updates or things like that, and you're, all of a sudden all your typefaces don't work. Um, it, the, the technology around the typefaces and, and, and where you can install them and how you use them and things like that, that's all still part of the, the, the type game and, and how people can use them and what makes it easy and things like that. Uh, as Alex was saying, too, you, you know, the, it is a lot of print-related mentality around this stuff. I think... I only started seeing uh, WOFFs in Font Explorer in like the last year, uh, you know, and those things have been around for five at this point, and and it, it takes a while to get there. Um, there isn't anything that is like this magic bullet tool that allows you to to, to manage all this stuff and and is perfect. Uh, but what what is nice about it is there are tools that you can use to organize your typefaces and and turn them on and off and control them. But that's where I was starting to get into a little bit of like you release some fonts that are a beta, they go to external third parties, get on a server at a design agency, people start using them, and all of a sudden you're like, oh well, there's no S in there because this was the beta and we didn't we 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 were only trying to see if it was installing and and working correctly, and so you're missing characters and then. I know you wanted to talk later about licensing and distribution and things like that. And then all of a sudden, version 1.0 or version 0 0.1 gets out into the the world of like thievery blogs, and you're basically always going to dig yourself out of the fact that 600,000 people downloaded this file that was like your beta. Um, I typically try to run all of our businesses, which includes Bright Break Rate and uh, Avondale Typeco, as a little bit more of like a Willy Wonka style uh, scenario where the gates are closed and we're at, we'll, we'll call some people in when we're ready to, to, to do that. Uh, and I think that that's the smartest way with type uh, because every day you're doing a new build of your typeface and it's not smart to, to really start giving it out to everybody uh, when you're at all these different stages because then that's what they have and they don't get the new one. And then they're stuck with like a, a typeface that like, crashes your computer or doesn't work or whatever not saying ours do that they don't but i don't know, think they when can. you're in beta <laughs> alex crashes his own computer quite a bit probably <laughs> That's true. yeah and i've learned i you know i've learned from software that when you get into that situation like even if something isn't working and you tell users like here's a version that works it's still a challenge to get them to actually follow through and install something new yeah then you get into uninstall the old one and right. they're named the same because you want to maintain consistency and 
Right. It's yeah. Yeah, a lot of times I'll I'll give beta versions that have like a limiting character set. Uh just because like like so, like some very important character is missing uh that will basically like force people to to install the new version. Like if if the a font has like everything except for maybe like an ampersand or a dollar sign or, or one of the like keyboard accessible characters that when pressed would just like break you out of that font and then it's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I, 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 yeah, I beta at that point. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting technique. <laughs> um, but yeah, we can, we can dig a little bit more into this, uh, this distribution and licensing question because this is something that is kind of fascinating to me. Um, especially like going back to the comparison to the software world um, where so much of this has been figured out. I get the impression that a lot of it uh, with type has not been figured out to its ideal solution yet. Um, so I just want to get like your your opinions on like, do you think, for instance, like font files, are they more prone to piracy than other uh, kind of design works, I guess? Um, well, I, I think... The, I'm, I'm going to handle this one, Alex, because <laughs> I deal with this all, all day. Um, what I want to talk about, piracy, licensing, usage, distribution, one of the things that's really important to basically lead this whole conversation with is designers should not steal from other designers. Um, Agreed. It doesn't matter what we're talking about with licensing or any of those things, if you are a professional working designer, you should not steal fonts from other designers. Right. Every time you're putting something out professionally, it should be licensed correctly. You you would be just as mad as if you know another company steals your PSDs or UI or whatever. Um, it's the same thing. But as we clearly can see by music and, and movies and all the other entertainment industries, there's a lot of piracy going on because people kind of people who don't necessarily have as much in the game don't care. Um, I know a lot of times people are are working on things and they're like, "Well, I got this font from so and so, and I'm going to use it." If it gets to that point, that's bad. It, even if you're using it, when you do turn it into something, it should be purchased always. Um, and I don't say that because I, you know, Alex and I work at a type type foundry. I say it because you shouldn't be stealing anything that, that is part of your professional career for a lot of reasons. One being you could get sued and it's a stupid reason to get sued. Uh, but in terms you of things like, is it, sued. what? You can get your client sued, which is way worse. You can get, yeah, exactly. Everyone gets sued. Um, but in terms of things like prone to piracy, you get a folder of files and it's just as easy to drag it to a USB drive or whatever, a server or things like that, um, it's, that's, that's a tough spot because it, it is easy in terms of airdropping a, full, a zipped folder of fonts from one person to the other. But I do think we're a little bit behind in terms of designers' understanding of what a license actually means. Uh, we kind of struggle with this too a little bit even at Avondale Typeco because you have like a personal usage license and a commercial usage, usage license or an education license or a nonprofit license or um, broadcasting license or app license. Like every, all of this stuff as technology is pushing forward is making all of this stuff interesting. And that's why you see companies like Hofler doing their own version of essentially Typekit with their own typefaces is because we're not going to give you full versions of this stuff necessarily and, and you can put it on your on your website and it doesn't lead to like wide-scale piracy of, of everybody downloading all the files and having them to pass around and stuff like that. Right. Uh, that stuff is new in the type game. It's, it's, that's the things that are pushing... Uh, all of the, 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 the type options that we have as designers forward. And Hofler did an awesome job. It's so stable. Um, we use it all the time for, for our clients uh, it, when we're doing design. But for someone like Alex and myself, we don't have the resources to build 
cloud typography ourselves. It was something that took them like years with many different people working on it. We would never get there. But there are things like, I think it's font stand, um, and, and, and there is Typekit and things like that, and Google Fonts, and you can put your, your typefaces in different places if you want to give people that access to use them that way. We have specific licensing. Uh, I think our, our, we're about to relaunch an entirely new Avondale Typeco in about 15 days. Uh, the brand changed like 15 days ago, and the entire website's going to be very different, giving people easier ways to check out than we've given in the past. So people can buy 300 seats if they want to now. Uh, and it wasn't something that we had the option to do at the beginning just because we're trying to figure out on our own, our own end, how are people using this stuff? Yeah. And I, I'll say that, like, I think that type, type design, the type design community right now is in kind of a weird, tough spot um, in terms of, like, the licensing thing because on the one hand we all know that type is software, right? And it's, it's crazy considering type is software that in all of the years that type has been software, nobody in this entire vast, enormous type community has figured out a way to add license keys to, to the software. Like when you buy it, you get a license code or so, some sort of like extra level of security other than just getting it and, and like installing it immediately with no no extra security. And I think that, I, and this is all just me pondering this as we're speaking, but so don't take it as like <laughs> too much of necessarily my opinion on it. But um, I, I'm wondering if maybe like it's so widespread, the, the idea of like pirating a font that company, if a company came out and was like the first one to allow every single, to make all of their fonts like extra encrypted and extra like have that extra level of difficulty in accessing it or make it harder for people to pirate it they might come off as seeming as like assholes or something well look at look at spotify and apple music i mean same type of digital transmission of files and basically they move to we give you nothing it's all cloud it's all internet um and that's because that's going to stop the piracy there. If you don't have your hands on the files, no one is like disassembling their iPhone OS <laughs> to like pull out right. the, the Spotify downloaded files and stuff like that. Um, right. But I, I honestly want to 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 say to Alex's you know thoughts about the first people who would do that would pr probably be the dicks. Uh, but I, I I think it's an education thing. Um, Design schools aren't even really teaching the difference between a personal usage and a commercial license to students that are using that all the time. I, I remember when I started my master's degree and I walked into to the school on the first day uh, and the, the advisor handed out a CD-ROM of like every design program to every person who was there. And I was like, this is great, but this is also horrible at the same time. Like, you need to be telling people why they need to actually have this stuff as opposed to you just giving it to, to, to everybody. But right. there is also things with, you know, cloud typography or Typekit or even Adobe Creative Cloud that designers are getting are starting to get hit with a lot of ongoing fees that we didn't used to have. You used to be able to buy an Adobe suite flat out and that you could use that for five years if you really wanted to. Um, the cost of what Creative Cloud is now, av every year you're essentially buying a brand new license for yourself as to what it used to be. Um, type isn't like that. I mean, that's what's great about it is if you can find something that really defines you in, in, in your creative space, you can use that if you've purchased the license on as many professional projects as you want, um, which is great. And, you know, that's, that's how it goes. But even things like Typekit, over time, if you're paying for it, I know it now comes with your with your Creative Cloud license. But if you're paying for it and it's separate or standalone or for a company that they want they don't want to tie it to a Creative Cloud because it's a it's an organization and they don't want it to be one to one with somebody. Um, over time, if it's thirty nine bucks or fifty nine bucks, you're paying that every year or you're paying your your account by the month. So the other component of that too, which I don't think people really understand around licensing and why this stuff costs money in the first place is 
good typography takes time to create. It's not something that Alex can sit down and knock out in a day. Uh, some of the typefaces that he's worked on have taken him you know, up to a year to get all the ideas out, which for some typographers is even short in the length of time. That's not 80 hours a week sitting, you know, slaving over what's going to be made, but they don't happen magically. To, to put out a good typeface takes time, and in the same exact way that people would want to go eat a fancier meal or buy nicer clothing or things like that, that's how prices, I know, I know one of the, the, the questions was about how do you price things. We typically tend to price them in terms of how many variations of the typeface have, have come together, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that took the most time, which is kind of ironic when you, when you dig through that. You know, you look at, you look at something like Futura, which has uh, a million different cuts, like Futura TOT, Futura OT, Futura, Futura that comes built into your Mac, which is like the, the dumbed down uh, limited license version, things like that. You dig into Futura, there might be like, 350 different weights, styles of one specific Futura. That took somebody like a lifetime to put that to put that together. That's not something that even if you were able to do a few characters a day, that's like years. So I think there's this education thing that that designers know that they need to pay for fonts, but I feel like it's it, it, it should be much more upfront in our industry where it's bad form if you don't. Because you're hurting your fellow, your peers on this stuff. Right. Right. And, and as a designer, like, I'm not necessarily designing a font just so I can go out and sell it and make some bucks off of it. I'm, I'm design like, the only reason I enjoy designing fonts is because of how cool it is to put something out there and see it get used and know that you fill the need for someone, you know? So I, I don't want to, like add an extra level to stop someone from from uh wanting to like de uh, buy my font you know right i don't want to yeah i I, and I want people to use it i want to get it in the hands of like as many people as possible and i think that we're uh that's i think that's part of the reason avondale type co we try really hard to make our fonts like affordable to to find that line between uh worth our while and affordable for someone who wants to buy it. That's actually a good, a good point too. Just a one sentence caveat, uh, working in design, we buy fonts all the time for the projects we work on. Sometimes they're $10, sometimes they're $20 and sometimes buying a family is $700 when we have to buy a full family. I don't want to necessarily say that we have aimed to be kind of on the cheaper end of the spectrum, but we we are, which is nice, and so you could you could buy two fonts to try them out. You could see how Overlook and Timberline play together, or how Rosemary and Timberline play together, as opposed to having to commit to like a family that's seven hundred dollars. Uh, we 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 definitely try to keep keep pricing fair for right. when we sell this stuff because we want people to buy it and. We would rather price it on that end of the spectrum and have people actually buy it and get the true license rather than it be more expensive and everybody's stealing it. Right. And so like you said, um, just thinking back to uh, making it easy for people to get the right license that they need and also the affordability thing. Like I think about um, iTunes, for instance, like selling songs for 99 cents. I have to think that that had an impact on music piracy, right? Uh, just because things... When things are a certain threshold of accessibility and affordability, like it becomes easier than pirating, essentially. That's that's true. But what's fucked up about iTunes is when you had the print version and you the the physical copy and you could go to Best Buy and sometimes buy it for eight ninety nine or seven ninety nine or nine ninety nine iTunes started where everything was nine ninety nine or whatever, but now some of the albums are like twelve ninety nine, thirteen ninety nine, fifteen ninety nine, and that's kind of fucking bullshit when you think about it because there's nothing physical being manufactured. At the the price increases for Apple's right. cut. Um, it, it it's digitally dis distributed, which costs nothing. I mean, there are servers, and I get that there is something in the back end, but when you produce something, shipped it, pressed it, things like that. Uh, 
that's why Apple Music and Spotify are going to end up totally taking over. I know that Apple's been moving to not selling anything except just subscribing. Right. And that's going to kind of continue to push the uh, the whole like Google, Apple, where you want to go component of things. And that's what's right. cool about fonts is we're not in that space. The stuff we make works on both. But when you get digitally distributed uh, media or content and things like that, Apple wants you to use Apple Music on the Apple TV, on the Apple Entertainment Center, and the Apple Home. Um, right. But at the same time, a whole family can get that now for fifteen ninety nine, and it's basically all you can eat buffet, which is the same model that Typekit uses. Right. You pay to have a subscription, and you can basically use whatever you want on the on the platform. Um, there is definitely something really cool to thinking of things that way, and. We have approached other people in various times throughout Avondale Typeco asking, can we put our fonts on your platform? What does that really entail and how does that work? Uh, so that we can get it in front of a lot, a, a lot more people than people who actually know who we are. Uh, we have, you know, we have on one end of the spectrum, we've sold a, a bunch of enterprise licenses to a university for them to use and install on their computers at the university. On the other hand, you have Things like a company where 300-ish people want it for, uh, they want all of our typefaces to use as their like corporate identity files, which means one user, one license times 300, and like how do you work through that stuff? But everybody has access to Typekit who has a, a Creative Cloud account. Everybody has access to Google Fonts. They're free, and I think they're all free to use too if they're if they are on Google Fonts. Um, the only thing that's tough is we're not. Adobe and we're not Google. So right. for the small guys trying to, to really do this stuff, it's not as easy as saying like, we're happy if you use it, get, we'll give it away for free. Uh, if we kept doing that, there we can't exist. So maybe this kind of Apple Music model is an evolution of the kind of iTunes mindset, but yeah, it's kind of like dominated by major players. So it's tough to see you know, I guess how that uh, comes down to independent shops. We're just trying to make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I guess now I want to move on to kind of like the softer uh, elements of type. Um, I know that Alex was talking earlier about giving typefaces personalities, um, but I'm also interested in, uh, you know, how a, how a typeface's personality can interact I guess, with people who view it or maybe even people who use it? Um, like what kind of psychological or subconscious influences it might have? Um, the user experience of typography? Right, exactly. So I know that in UI UX, um, you can use typography to your advantage to draw users to actions and uh, kind of do that. But are there more like nuanced, nuanced ways in different contexts that... Uh, to kind of influence people, I guess. Alex, maybe if you want to talk about uh, ATC Harris's dev cut. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily going to answer the question as much. Um, but, well, if we want to go into that. So we, uh, our, our one of our type designers, um, Quan, he was uh, designing this monofont and he designed it with a certain personality in mind um, and made a lot of design choices to accommodate that personality, right? Um, of course, yeah, yes, it was a monofont, and like, you kind of get the idea of a personality when, when somebody says monofont, but he definitely had some unique uh, design elements within it. And um, one thing that we were really excited about uh, when the prospect came out that a monofont was going to get made through ATC was the fact that our devs could use it, developers could use it, because a lot of times that's, how, that's where we encounter monofonts is in like snippets of code or uh, like, because like that's really the, the only use left for, for a monofont that's using it for its like true purpose, right? Otherwise it's just like for the coolness of how it looks. But uh, what we ran into when we did start like putting them into actual code editors and seeing how it looked was that the emotion that he was adding to it 
uh, actually made it not work that well as like a dev font, as a font that for like for the uses that we were excited about um, having a font for, it, it wasn't really working that well. So we had to create a, a dev cut of that font um, that reduced a lot of that emotion and really just focused on all of the elements that needed to get fixed in order for it to be way more legible and as legible as possible for any font to be seen in like a code editor. Um, what, what was the other part of your question? Uh, yeah, so I, I guess I was just asking um, how is so like part of it is the kind of intended usage for a typeface and how you plan for that, um, but also how like once you finish that, um, how it impacts the the viewer or the reader, I guess, uh, once it's out in use. Um, a lot of times, the intended use is pretty vague uh, when I'm designing something. When I say vague, I mean like I I don't design necessarily with the idea in mind that something is going to be used specifically on like a cereal box or specifically on like uh, subway transport or like wayfinding signs or something. Um, although I'd love the opportunity, but I'm more designed to thinking like, I want this font to be very usable. I want this font to have a certain emotion or I want this font to feel like something out of like this era or something like that right um so i think that drives a lot of like where where the designs start um sometimes that gets followed through all the way to like completion um for example like i just designed uh we released i think we released did we release dual this year or last year jason last year so at the end of last year we released um dual which I started the idea for that design wanting something that felt really cool in like car and motorcycle culture, like that would fit in with like trucks and, and like, uh, like car logos and stuff like that. Um, and in fact, I think a, a lot of the inspiration for that font came from a really old moped store sign that I saw. Uh, just like I drove past it one day, I barely even got to like take a photo of it, but it's the like feeling of it stuck with me. Um, and that I think was carried through all the way to the completion of the font with the like, I think five weights or six weights. I, I, I should know this better, but I think it's like, five, yeah, it's five weights of that font. And so that one worked out, but a lot of other fonts you start with one thing and realize that either that doesn't work or you find like a new reason to uh, to keep it going or a new reason to uh, like a new emotion to add to it um, or and it totally ends up in a different spot than you started uh, but it kind of feels good anyway you know <laughs> like it's all about the process so if in that process it totally changes what you started what you started as, then that's fine. Like as long as it feels good. Yeah. And, uh, just digging more into, um, kind of the impact that it has at the end. Uh, so much of the information that we consume is, is, uh, conveyed over text. Um, so I just, I don't know, I have a vague interest in types kind of role in culture and what impacts it can have there. So I think what Alex was talking about when he was talking about the creation of the typefaces and right. what his intent is, and sometimes it ends up where he thought, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. The other component of type is all are, are really all of the things that make typefaces what they are. Legibility, uh, usability, functionality. Uh, it, we... we because there's a lot of things going on there. Um, one is a lot of people, even if we intend for people to use something like a, a workhorse or a body copy type text, they're still going to use it for headlines. And there's still, it, there's a lot of incorrect usage. Uh, and, and we don't know a lot of the defined uh, intent for a lot of the typefaces that we have. 
Uh, but there's, there's kind of the proper usage, which is you typically tend to pick things uh, that will accomplish what you need it to do in that spot. So you, you have a, 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 a wide range of difference between something like wedding invitations versus something like the New York subway. All typography, sometimes hand-lettered, sometimes you know computer version of hand-lettered, and then you have, on the other hand, Helvetica, which is like, let's make it as, as, as neutral as we can and clean and things like that. Um, the other component of it is, is that people bring their own uh, component to all typography. So you, when you're creating something and you're doing signage, you don't necessarily know whether the people that are going to be engaging with that are colorblind or don't have great vision and things like that. There's an awesome thing going on right now uh, with the U.S. government. They, they changed all of the signage on the highways I think it was like 2002, and they, they went from uh, the, the typeface that had been on there for 50 years or whatever, uh, and then they, they created a new, more legible typeface, which it's legitimately more legible. Uh, there, there, there was tests around distance and all those other things. Uh, and then this year, the government is backpedaling and saying we're eliminating... Uh, the new legible typeface because we our conclusion of the research was that the old signs were just dirty. And it's like, <laughs> one, how much bullshit can the government stick in your face and, and, you, not be, and, and you believe it? Because the, 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 the created typeface was created by professional type designers for legibility versus the, the old. Um, and, and, and you don't know what people are going to bring to it. You know, the, that's not a the sign is dirty kind of thing, but that's I grew up where there's a lot of things that are in the Swiss style. People in New York engage with New York City subway all the time. That's a, a much more controlled type environment than really anyone else's type in their, in their public transportation. But the reason why that type face was chosen in the first place was so that people didn't have to get through ornamentation to understand what what stop they're getting off at. Right. Um, that's what's so funny when you get into a New York City subway now. Uh, you have the, like, upcoming stops, and it's basically, like, an LED uh, digital display that looks like it's from, like, the mid-'80s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, why didn't you, why didn't you bring the, the, the Helvetica all the way through to this digital display so that it's at least consistent? Because you're, you're bringing this, like, if, if anyone has any sort of, like, red color blindness, like, it doesn't work. Right. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the, the how we use type component of it and, and, and why we use things certain ways. That's less, obviously, as Alex creates, we're looking for things like uh, rivers and, and all of the things that can screw up a character. Uh, but we're not necessarily knowing that it's going to go on a car logo or how people are going to use it. And then you have to figure out as a designer, is this even the appropriate typeface for what I'm trying to make right now? Right. So that's what's, that's what's kind of interesting about this, this whole space in general is there's so many typefaces. There's so many sands that could be workhorses. They're not all good, but they're out there. And it's up to the designers to really vet, uh, this is right for me because it has the right, right amount of emotion. It has the right legibility for where it's going to go. That's that's kind of how I would think about that piece. And the coolest part is like after you're done designing a font and seeing it in use it, and seeing it in ways where uh, you would never have assumed it working, but it works way better than you had ever imagined. Like for example, I, I won't say the name, but we were approached by a pretty large um, like TV network uh, asking about whether or not, or basically asking if they could uh, buy like many licenses because they were playing with that typeface uh, to use as their new like channel logo, their new basically corporate mark. And I just went in, I'm like, I, I can't see that working. And then I typed it in, in that typeface, their name, and it worked so well. It was like exactly the tone of that that network basically like it works that's so a well. that's a sign of a good designer <laughs> <laughs> so i think you you asked something about like how type uh influences culture mm -hmm. earlier i think 
I don't know if I could go as far as to speak to how it impacts like worldwide culture as a whole, but I will say that in in the design community and in like design culture, type seems to work very similarly to how like fashion design works and how uh, fashion trends work. I think there's definitely trends with fonts and some fonts like will come out and get crazy popular and then get crazy overused and then nobody wants to use them anymore and then several years later it comes back into style or that like it, it, I mean type type design type design is like integrally linked with design trends right so uh nobody's ever using Helvetica anymore ever you never see it in fact I just read like an article I think on FASCO that was that said uh the new rules of minimalism never use Helvetica <laughs> uh and I think in, that, in the case of that font in particular, it was already overused, but nobody, nobody knew. Like designers had a pass to use Helvetica. I still think to, to kind of caveat that, people going for, they're, they're, I, I know exactly what article you're, t I think I saw an alternatives of Helvetica this week from like Font Shop or something too. And it's basically like, there's 20 really other great typefaces that have subtle nuances that are in the ser sans serif space, heavily, you know, heavily diverse from like ultra lights or, or like ultra thins to fat or black. Um, it, it, it's interesting because I think people who can use type well um, can always do those styles. The, the reason why, so as designers like Alex and, and me, like every day, we're, we're looking at different typefaces because of, uh, one, we want to bring forth the, the right personality. But two, if we always use Helvetica, our jobs become boring as fuck. Everything can't be Helvetica all day. Uh, it gets boring. And so a lot of times type designers that are really good at it will go and pick out those like really niche uh, typefaces to bring into products that no one is using because they're like, this is the exciting part of this project. Uh, a lot of the typefaces that we've created are not workhorses. Uh, they're more so for those like touches. Um, I think I pretty much used a, a Futura TOT for myself, uh, for my personal brands, and then for BBG when we were creating our brand. And I think I used it like for almost everything I did for like eight years. And then I, I just started designing a, a more recent personal thing. And I started with Futura and I'm like, you know what? Let's let's go somewhere else here. It, it's I don't need to have the the same. There, there's a uh, someone who notoriously has claimed that I they can't use Futura because I've owned it. <laughs> um, I can't say who, but it's it's kind of funny. I, I feel like the good usage of that, and when you really nail it, uh, everyone kind of gets like envy. Uh, but like Alex was talking about too with trends of overuse um, that also leads to a lot of misuse. I mean, a good example of this was Archer, which Hofler released. Uh, and it was released for, I think it was like Martha Stewart magazine. Uh, and then it basically was used only there and exclusive for a while. And then it was like, cool, this is now for sale. You know, I run a bakery, I'm going to use it. And then all of a sudden you see like tech companies and, and other places where it's not exactly the right personality type, but it's like, it's just trendy. I mean, you, you you saw a lot of that too with uh, Obama, uh, both president uh, presidential elections and and the usage of Gotham is like oh what's this clean sands that is so cool oh all right it's Gotham I'm gonna use it I mean like designers designers like to feel like they came up with a new idea you know, I think that design is very similar to songwriting in that way where you don't want to be the song you don't want to be the guy writing every single song using the same four chords. No one's gonna buy your album, you know? You want, I mean, yes, you you wanna be known for like being the guy who owns a certain font or like who perfected the use of something, but you also wanna show some versatility, I think. And I think that's why fonts are so popular in the design community or like font design and so many different type foundries and so many people doing it independently and 
you know, every, every like young, like type designer just starting out wants to be the guy who like creates that next new trend, trendy typeface and wants to be the guy who can like, yeah, make the, a typeface that everybody can use and everybody all of a sudden it gets viral and it goes across the world and you right. see it on about like the next presidential campaign. <laughs> So I guess um, just to kind of wrap up those two halves, it's like, uh, you know, type influences cultures in the sense, or like design culture in general, in the sense that um, it influences trends and certain feelings that people might think they want to go for. Uh, but then on the other hand, um, to Jason's point about people bringing their own experiences and things to type itself, um, that maybe culture has an influence on type as well. I mean, of course it does, but <laughs> maybe there are two halves. I think that design has a lot to do with, I mean, design is, is how things are perceived, right? I think that um, design plays a huge part in how people perceive culture and how people perceive cultures they're not a part of, um, in how, people perceive their own cultures. Uh, I mean, we're surrounded by design 100% of the time. Unless we're literally like nude in the forest, we are always surrounded by design, whether it's the design of the road that we're driving on in the car that is designed for us or the, you know, like uh, the clothes that we're wearing. Like there's, there's nothing that isn't designed in some way and it all has thought behind it and it all has trend behind it and um, I think it influences us uh, like a hundred percent of the time it's it's the biggest influence we have I think right how dare you think <laughs> that the forest is not designed <laughs> well I was going to say you could um, I might be going too far to say that anytime you make a decision you've designed something so if you decided to be nude in the forest, then you might have designed that experience for yourself. You you designed your own <laughs> nakedness. <laughs> yeah. Possibly. It's true. But yeah, so I guess I just want to wrap up. Alex, you mentioned, um, you know, beginning type designers, but do you guys have uh, just any general words for them? Because I feel like type design is still kind of, I don't know, I might be wrong, but my perception is that it's still kind of a mysterious craft. So mm -hmm. any advice that you have for, for people listening who are interested in it? I think that people need to treat type design the same way they would treat like entering a career in being a tattoo artist. <laughs> you have to learn everything there is to know about it before you can go and like try to put something on somebody or try to put something out into the world in right. the case of type. It's there type is thousands of years old like the concept of typography it's thousands of years old we have thousands of years of people having like trial and error people understand like spending their entire lives devoting it to studying type creating type and all of that knowledge co has compounded on itself over you know hundreds of decades and I think to to not at least try to know as much of those rules as possible is lazy, you know? It's it's the same like it's the old cliche of um like how like the, the everyone tells the story of how Picasso knew the rules before he could before he decided to start breaking them. Right. Where you look at his like early work and it's all um really nice like close to classical painting stuff and then he got into the weird stuff and it was so great because you could tell he knew what he was doing right so you have to know you have to tr at least try to know as many of the basics as possible i think it's important to be a good designer to be a type a good type designer it's important to be able to use type well to know how to design it well um i think there are like a few very simple fundamental things that people need to know that a lot of beginning type designers seem to not know uh, just like simple stuff like like where where a stroke should be thinner in a 
in a letter form, mm -hmm. you know, like a simple sans serif, like where should a stroke be thinner for it to read across a page better? What, like, if you're designing a typeface with like multiple weights, how do you extrapolate that? How does it get fatter? Um, how uh, the basics of like, what is, what is an, an X height? Why is it called that? You know, where did serifs come from? Like, it's just like, what, just like knowing, knowing that a certain uh, type of classic font to, uh, type design came out from what like the tip of a pen looked like or, or was shaped like and that's why the letter form is shaped that way it's it's there's just like so much to know i could go on forever but i think the takeaway is study a lot and be really into it and be in be be a nerd about it before you start trying to just like draw some stuff draw some letters and make words awesome Jason, anything to add to that? I, I definitely don't want to get into a good designer, bad designer wrap up of this. <laughs> uh, I think type design is really an interesting space. I, I think there's a lot of poorly designed faces. I think there's also a lot of amazing designed faces. For anyone who's really interested in doing it themselves, uh, like Alex was saying, you basically just got to know your, you know, you need to know the roots. You need to know why specific type was created in a certain way and how you can, you can put your stamp on it. It's, it's a medium where everybody knows what it's supposed to look like, right? Like if you're an icon designer, for example, which is like, a. a a, like a good parallel to type design, icon design. <clears throat> you can design an icon for uh, like a car and it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to have the very basics of what a car is. And on top of that, like, yeah, you, you maybe want all your strokes to be the same weight and everything, but nobody's gonna get, uh, get too like annoyed if it's, uh, if it doesn't have like the nuances that maybe like uh, the letter H should have. Everyone knows what the letter H looks like. Um, we've been seeing it since we could read. And when you're designing those letter forms, all you're doing is making choices. You have to make very simple, subtle choices. You have to decide like, all right, how thick is this stroke? Do I have to make this stroke this thick or maybe it needs to be a little thinner because the rest of the letter takes up a lot of space or takes up a lot of visual space. It's like, is this uh, curve perfectly rounded? Is it subtly like squared off? Is it, there's so many subtleties and you're constantly having to make very, very simple uh, and very uh, like minute decisions that it's really hard to do that without knowing at least the basics of what it's supposed to be. You have to start somewhere. I would add to, to get some education in type and not jump in totally uh, cold. Like Alex was saying, uh, we're born and as soon as we start reading, we're, we're connected to type. I kind of feel like it has the same parallel where uh, everybody has an iPhone, so like they're a professional photographer kind of thing. And it's totally not the case. And it's worse when... You create something in type that's supposed to be legible and somebody uses it and, you know, something gets fucked up, like an accident happens because somebody couldn't read a sign in time. There's a lot of conversation with this in the medical field with UI around um, presentation of data. And you get into a spot where it's like the wrong type choice could kill somebody, uh, you know, and, and that's twofold. It's the creation of the, the typeface and it's the fact that some designer used it for that particular execution, that's, it, it, it's all connected. Um, and so it's an interesting space because the wrong typeface could have really crazy consequences. All right. Well, I think that that is excellent advice. Um, and I think that wraps up this episode. So thank you guys again for coming on. Thanks for having yes. us. Yes. Thank, 
thanks for having us. If, if anyone is interested, I don't know if you're going to be posting it out. Um, AvondaleTypeCo.com is a good place to look at our typefaces. Uh, Alex, who designs a lot of our typefaces, is the only good Alex on Twitter. Uh, and I'm Jay Crimes on Twitter.